Let me get the audio working.
someone was nice enough to do a Reader's Digest version. It runs about a thousand pages, even in tiny print, so it's no surprise that very few Americans have actually read it. But it's about to affect all of us, and many have been wondering what it will mean for our health, our wallets, and our country. Let's say we take all 310 million Americans and squish us down to just 25 people. Yep, each of these folks would represent about 12 million of us, and this is pretty much what we'd look like. Polls show about three out of ten of us say health care reform will make us better off. A similar number say worse off. And a similar number again say it won't make much difference at all. Some of us don't know what to think. I guess you could say we're kind of split on this one. But no matter where you stand on the issue, it's likely you're thinking, hello, I got some basic questions still unanswered here. And you deserve real answers, not the partisan rhetoric and spin we've been flooded with. So let's break down what the reform law does and doesn't do and what it will cost. If you want to read the whole law, go ahead. But watching this video is the next best thing. Ready to jump in? Let's begin with the problems in our current health care system. Problem number one is what problem number one usually is, money. Most people agree that health insurance policies are too expensive. For family, the average premium is almost $14,000 a year and growing. Premiums have doubled over the last nine years, ballooning way faster than inflation. Plus, our population is aging, meaning more people with more health problems. So health care costs are the fastest growing part of the federal budget. The second problem is that the system is full of holes, like the fact that people buying insurance on their own can be turned down for having a pre-existing health condition. Small businesses may be charged extra if some of the workers are sick, making insurance unaffordable. And some insurance policies have a lifetime limit on benefits. After that, you're out of luck. That means some of the people least likely to have coverage are the ones who need it most. Nice, huh? <coughs> the high costs and holes in the system mean more than one in seven of us have no health insurance to protect us at all. Many more struggle to pay their bills and can only afford bare minimum policies that may not cover much. High cost to households, strain on the federal budget, and people with no protection. It's easy to see why many people were looking for something different. So here's what the health reform law plans to do in its first phase between now and 2014. To start dealing with cost, insurers will be limited in how they spend our premium dollars. If they use too much for administrative cost or profits, they'll be forced to give some of it back through rebates. This won't stop premium increases, but it may help some. Some services will become free in all new private insurance policies and in Medicaid, preventive care like screenings and vaccinations. People on Medicare, because they're over 65 or disabled, will get more help with their drug costs. Young people can save money and stay insured by remaining on their parents' policies up to age 26. And some small businesses will get tax breaks to help them pay for health insurance for their workers. And the polls, well, some will be closed starting now, too. Lifetime limits on health coverage will be gone whether you buy your insurance on your own or get it from your employer. And it will be illegal to turn kids down for having a pre-existing health condition like asthma or diabetes. Where some adults who buy insurance on their own will still be getting rejected between now and 2014, those who do can enter something called a high-risk pool run by the government. No, it's more like a policy that covers the sickest uninsured people, meaning it's riskier for insurance companies. That's why the government will chip in some money to bring down the cost. Some say these high-risk pools will help a lot of people. Others say the pools will still be too expensive and may not have enough government money to stay in business until they're replaced by something better. 
in phase two. On New Year's Day 2014, some big changes kick in. First, let's look at how the law makes health care more affordable. Medicaid will be expanded to cover all low-income individuals and families in every state. And depending on what you make, if you lose your job or your employer doesn't provide decent coverage, you may get a health insurance tax credit. And while most of us will continue to get health insurance at work, just like now, if you don't have that option, you'll be able to buy coverage in what's called an exchange. You'll be hearing a lot about them, so let's stop and look at how they work. An exchange is like a virtual insurance mega mall. Based on where you live, you'll get an easy to understand menu of options to compare plans in plain English. And the exchange makes sure insurance companies compete fairly under strict rules. The idea is that by giving consumers good information, a fair playing field, and access to lots of choices, competition among insurers will keep rates competitive. Now, on to plugging the holes. In 2014, insurers will no longer be able to turn people down or charge them more if they're sick. You might say, hold on a minute. If I can't be turned down and charged more, why not just wait until I get sick or injured to buy insurance at all? Not so fast, buddy. See, with few exceptions, people will be required to have insurance or pay a special tax. Same with larger businesses who will pay fines if they don't insure their workers. Of course, nobody likes being told they have to buy anything. But without this rule, experts say you can't require that everyone be eligible for coverage. Imagine telling home insurers they have to cover people whose houses are already on fire. So the government will provide credits, expanded programs, and new rules. They say that by 2019, 32 million of us who don't have health insurance will have it. Some of those who will still be uninsured, undocumented immigrants who aren't eligible for coverage under the law. No surprise, all of this is going to cost money, $938 billion over the next 10 years, according to the Congressional Budget Office, the impartial referee when Congress debates these kinds of things. <coughs> it's a lot of money, sure, but if you look at it another way, it's 2% of our federal budget and 3% of what we'll be spending on health care overall. Now the President and Congress insist that these new costs will be paid for so they don't push the budget deficit up any further. That means money will come out of someone's pocket. That's where the tough politics come in. A lot of savings will come from health care providers and insurers in the Medicare program. The fees the government pays to hospitals under Medicare won't be allowed to rise as fast as they have been. And insurance companies that provide services to people on Medicare will be paid less. Medicare will also create a bunch of experiments around the country to test different ways of paying doctors, hospitals, and other providers to make the healthcare system more efficient and improve the quality of care. With luck, some of these experiments will work and then be adopted by the private sector and help lower costs for employers and families too. Plus, a new federal advisory board will make recommendations about other ways to deal with increases in healthcare costs. Some taxes will go up too. People with high earnings will pay higher Medicare taxes. There'll be new taxes on insurers and businesses who offer high-end benefit plans and on companies that make medical devices and drugs. And oh, anyone who visits a tanning salon now has to pay a new tax too. With these new cost-cutting measures and new taxes, the Congressional Budget Office says the whole package will actually reduce the federal deficit over the next 10 years. Of course, the total federal deficit is expected to run into the trillions, so the health reform law isn't going to solve that problem. Well, that's the reform law. Do you love it? Hate it? Still don't know? Either way, there's still a lot of work ahead. Yep. You'll be hearing lots of different things about this law. Some people support reform, and if anything, want to expand it and increase government oversight of insurers in the healthcare industry. Others oppose it and think it creates too big a role for the government. Some states have even gone to court claiming the requirement that everyone buy insurance is unconstitutional. Politicians and pundits will be talking to you as if you've got no idea what's in that thousand-page law. But by watching this, you're on your way to getting informed. And you can make sure your friends and family are, too, just by passing this little video around. There you go, guys. The tax reform bill in a nutshell. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, just go search Health Reform Explained Video.
see if I have anything else. Going. I like this one. Here's a good one. Y'all want another one? I'll, I think it's a good idea. I don't think it's perfect. But, yes, it's going to happen. I don't think it's perfect, but it'll evolve. Anyway, here's another good one that I like. As long as I'm in my Facebook. I don't go here very often, so. Actually, let's do it a little. There we go. That was on C-SPAN in Congress. Yeah, but it was meant just to, that's what they did on the floor in Congress. Now, this is non-political. It's just kind of funny. If you pick up any map of the world and look at the bottom. Here's a non-political one that's just funny. You ready? If you pick up any map of the world and look at the bottom, you'll find us, little old New Zealand, the last place to have its local population wiped out by the Europeans. It's mostly scenic down here. Everyone gets along with everyone else. And we still grow things the traditional way. In dirt. Yep, New Zealand is a great place to live. And coincidentally, it's a great place to make 42 Below vodka. In fact, if you're going to choose the perfect environment to make the world's most perfect vodka, you choose New Zealand. The water is pure and sweet. The air holds a standard for quality. And hardly anyone is French. 42 Below. A perfect vodka for the perfect world at an imperfect price. Actually, it's fucking expensive. <laughs> Actually, it's fucking expensive. Oh, and for you, those of you who haven't seen this, how's that? If you pick up any map of the world and look at the bottom, you'll find us, little old New Zealand, the last place to have its local population wiped out by the Europeans. It's mostly... If you pick up any map of the world... Yeah, and look it plays at the bottom, over and over and over again. Us, little old New Zealand. Let's face it, folks, the new health care reform law is complex. Now that one's playing again by itself. About a thousand pages, even in tiny print, so it's no... S <sighs> this is just awesome, guys. i gotta sh I, I, I got to share this with you. It's also not political.
the name of the song? Yeah, on a pipe organ. social cam. Yeah, sometimes when I'm in the stores, I make videos, guys. I don't know if y'all know it or not. But I can't, I don't broadcast on my, post them on my Facebook. And here's one of them. No, I'm just carrying it along my phone, actually. It's my phone doing it. Yeah, Android. <laughs> now this is Android Form Social Cam app. You know? They're there. <laughs> Go look at my wall, you'll find me. No, but it's owned by JT Bay. Uh, yes, of course it is. Public. Very important word there, public. No. JTV people started social cam. Uh, as long as, in some states, as long as one party's aware of it, you can. It only takes one party. Interesting enough. Florida's one of those. Not here you don't, Zappy Cakes. Just like the news media don't. Nobody does. 
public's public. You can do whatever you want to do with the camera. big lots guys well social cam won't live broadcast it just lets you post your videos to Facebook but the quality is definitely better yes Those of you who've never seen inside a big lots, it's a big lots when I was there yesterday. Carry it in my hand. Sort of. Morning, Kim. Yep, cheap. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's all mostly name brand. I have the Android. Harris. Me shopping in big lots, Kel. Just to upload. Yeah, mine's an early Android. I have before.
Okay, this is probably boring for you guys. But for people who don't have big lots, they like it. about Jeff and Wade? They're up uh, north. They're in Palm Bay. Don't know, Chief. Maybe. Watching me, watching myself shopping, correct. Chimes. Seashell chimes. Yeah, back in the witch hunt days, I would have been burned at the stake many times over. This would be a good one too. It is kind of political, so sorry.
talking to the Real News Network and Paul Jay from the University of University in Boston. In the recent U.S. midterm elections, one of the hot buttons issues in many parts of the country was an issue of undocumented workers, as we call it in the release. What effect does it have when people, because of their status, are willing to work for some time, even below minimum wage? But the question that rarely gets asked in this debate is why are so many people from south of the border here? And what happened to the economies of countries like Mexico? And did, in fact, U.S. policy have something to do with it? Now joining us to talk about that question is Timothy Wise, who's Director of the Research and Policy Program at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University in Boston. So why, why do so many people head north looking for work? Well, Paul, as I think it's pretty well known now, the, uh, the economies of uh, some of our main trading partners, such as Mexico, have not fared as well as people that hoped under uh, trade agreements like the North American Free Trade Agreement, now 16 years um, in operation. The job creation that took place in Mexico under that model, as we showed in a recent uh, Carnegie Endowment Report, was disappointing to say the least, and most economists recognize that. Now, we, we were told that the, the thing holding Mexico back was too much government public ownership, too much government regulation, so free up the economy, get the government out of the way, and productivity would go up and prosperity, especially with Mexico having so much oil, there would be great prosperity, and that would be the, the solution to the Mexican economy's problems. No, beyond that, they, they promised, the promise of NAFTA was that Mexico would be able to export goods and not people. That was the exclusive promise at the time of NAFTA, and it just hasn't been true. Manufacturing, which saw huge growth in the initial years of NAFTA, actually generated very few jobs because uh, it destroyed as many, many, almost as many manufacturing jobs as it created. Oh. And well, by by foreign companies coming in and out competing or buying up or um, or uh, bringing their products in and putting local firms out of business, so that put that lost jobs. And then the new firms that came in um, created some new jobs. But my area is agriculture, and that's the area where, um, even if there have been small, small gains in employment, manufacturing, and in the service sector, the agricultural sector has just been decimated. After liberalized trade, which allowed uh, U.S. goods, mainly meats and grains, to flow um, without tariff, inter tariff uh, protection into Mexico and compete directly with uh, uh, producers who are producing things like corn, not just for the big global marketplace, but for their own consumption. So tell us the story of corn. How did that, what's the mechanism of that and what were the consequences? Sadly, the um, NAFTA included a transition period for the liberalization of corn that the Mexican government unilaterally chose not to follow. So corn tariffs, which the Mexican government had used fairly consistently to protect their corn farmers from cheaper corn coming from the US, um, were eliminated very quickly after NAFTA, within two years of NAFTA. Corn flooded in, it, it imports increased over 400% um, in Mexico of U.S. corn. Uh, prices went down 66% in, in the 16 years of, Na uh, of NAFTA. And um, the impact on Mexican producers was obviously devastating. Because the argument would be what's wrong with cheaper food in Mexico? Well, cheaper food in Mexico is, is, is fine if that's translating into cheaper food. The only evidence that there's really been cheaper food in Mexico from that policy is that since it's mainly fed to animals, the pork might have gotten a little cheaper for some of urban consumers. But tortillas didn't get cheaper, um, which is the staple of the Mexican diet. And of course, the farmers who eat what they grow in addition to selling what they grow um, were devastated. The evidence is uh, that probably already in this like either. agriculture. Um, in, in it basically just tells how the U.S.'s moves have messed things up down there. I think that's about all I got. I'm going to play this one one more time just because I think it's really cool. Uh, by the way, does anybody want to know who does that song that I played the first one? No, the policy wasn't followed through properly, that's correct.
No. Lily Allen. I'm sure Nedrick will know who Lily Allen is. But I'm going to play it one more time because I really like it. About um, these some of these pet projects, they really don't make a whole lot of sense. And these sometimes these dollars they go to projects having little or nothing to do with the while driving the other day. Thank you. 
It's not on. Uh, Dylan. I believe. Looks a little wet there. Uh, North Dakota. a boat, not a car. Yeah, I remember. Probably why he's following the, the truck in front of him. So it'll fall in first. Awesome. This fellow passed away, but he is so good. You've got to see this. This will be the last video because I got to go store. But we're gonna watch it. Yeah, he passed away. Cool, Ash. 
See if there's anything else. It does okay, not great. Ah, here's a good one. I lied, I'm going to play another one.
If you pick up any map of the world and look at the borders, you'll find us the world you see the last country in the world population. They're all playing at once. Anyway, I'll be right back, guys. <laughs>